National Broadcasting Company presents Lives of Great Men, a new series on great leaders in human progress presented by Dr. Edward Howard Griggs, distinguished lecturer, critic, and author of The Philosophy of Art and many other books. In his talks, Dr. Griggs will build a story of civilization based on outstanding characters through the ages and how each one influenced his own and future times. This evening, Dr. Griggs will discuss Leonardo da Vinci, the mastermind of the Renaissance. We present Edward Howard Griggs. My friends, Savonarola sought to carry the world back to the spiritual life of Dante's time, standing for the minor motive of the Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci, born the same year with Savonarola, incarnated the dominant motive of the age, its love of life and eager turning to science and art. Leonardo is a fascinating mystery. A scientist, he was passionately devoted to art. An inventor and realistic student of nature, he was also dreamer and idealist. While enthusiastically worshiping beauty, there is no clear evidence that he was ever inspired by the love of a woman. With power of intense and incessant work, he left much unfinished. The most many-sided genius in an age producing myriad-minded men, he is inadequately expressed in the works that survive. Still in view of the range of his activity and achievement, he was perhaps the greatest man that ever lived. He was born at the castle of Vinci, a hilltop town in a fold of the Apennines, out of wedlock, evidently the result of a passionate love affair of his father with a girl of humble family. All accounts agree that Leonardo had great personal beauty and physical strength. The tradition is that he could take a coin like our silver dollar and break it in two with his fingers. As a boy, Leonardo kept all sorts of small animals in his room, showing his native scientific interest. He had high ability in mathematics, in drawing and clay modeling, and in singing and playing the lute. At 15, he was placed by his father with the painter Verrocchio, but soon was teaching his master more than he learned from him. At 20, he was launched as an independent artist and admitted to the Guild of Painters, and at 23, left his father's home permanently. His work during 10 years in Florence was largely in the field of painting, which was the main expression of the time. His interest, however, was that of the scientist. He wanted to track nature to her lair and find out how she did things. He loved especially to draw horses, also flowers and other things in nature. He would follow a grotesque or ugly face for miles into the countryside, quite as far as he would a beautiful one. When he had drawn the face, he was satisfied. He was not seeking to create a painting, but to discover nature's secret. So he loved to draw babies with personality just dawning, youths in whom it clearly awakens, very old men, where the decay of age accentuates idiosyncrasies of character. At 30, Leonardo removed to Milan, probably to enjoy larger freedom of activity, though he remained deeply attached to Florence, always signing himself Leonardo the Florentine. The Duchy of Milan was ruled by Lodovico il Moro of the Sforza family. The invitation to Leonardo is said to have resulted from his skillful lute playing, but in the draft of a letter to Ludovico, Leonardo emphasized his skill in inventing and making cannon and other instruments of war, his ability in architecture, and in fulfilling Lodovico's plan to erect a giant statue to the elder Sforza. Leonardo's 20 years at Milan formed the crowning period of his varied activity. He carried through great engineering works, some still in operation, dredging and confining river channels, constructing fortifications, bridges, and public buildings. He erected the giant model for the statue of Ludovico's father. It was one of the wonders of the world, but the casting was delayed, and in the wars that followed, it was utterly destroyed. Leonardo was also master of ceremonies at the Milan court, preparing masks, music, and plays to amuse the court circle, given once and never repeated. That would seem a waste of such superlative genius, but it was right, for art can have no higher function than in transfiguring the life of this moment. Among his paintings of the period, he achieved his masterpiece, on which he labored across ten years, the sadly ruined Last Supper on the monastery wall. The prior of the monastery complained to the duke that Leonardo would spend hours idly sitting before the painting, then put in a few strokes with the brush and go away. Leonardo explained to the duke that he was not idle, but thinking out his conceptions, 
and said that there were two difficulties almost insuperable. The first was to find a face worthy to represent the Christ. The second, to get one repulsive enough for the Judas. Leonardo added, while he sometimes despaired of achieving the Christ, he could as a last resort turn to the prior as a model for Judas. There were no further complaints of his delay. Tragically marred as is Leonardo's masterpiece, it remains a marvel, still instinct with his genius, Various drawings for it, especially the sublime one in red chalk of Jesus, help us to realize his conceptions. With the painting, I had the experience I recall Professor Grimm of Germany describing. As one studied it hour after hour, suddenly in a flash of revelation, one saw it as it left Leonardo's hand. The divinely serene Christ, the brazen Judas, the agitated apostles. Through the years, Leonardo was teaching a school of artists some of whom lived in his house and ate at his table. And also, he was steadily writing treatises on the fine arts, records of scientific investigation, and moral reflections on life. Let me give a few sentences translated from his notebooks. In life, beauty perishes, not in art. Tears come from the heart, not from the brain. Whoever in discussion adduces authority uses not intellect, but rather memory. Nature never breaks her own law. When fortune comes, seize her with a firm hand. In front, I counsel you, for behind she is bald. You do ill if you praise, but worse if you censure what you do not understand. Obstacles cannot bend me. He who fixes his course by a star changes not. Such is the pungent epigrammatic wisdom running through all these reflections on life. Leonardo developed a new method of writing, back across the page like ancient Hebrew. Thus to read one of his manuscripts, you must hold it before a mirror or reverse it against a window pane. Why did he do that? Was it merely to protect his copyright in a day when there was no other protection? Well, one of his pupils speaks of Leonardo's ineffable left hand. My own belief is that he was ambidextrous, able to use both hands with equal effectiveness, and that he wrote with his left hand back across the page with reversed letters, as one would write naturally with that hand, and saved his right hand for his sculpture and painting. This is only a guess, but Leonardo's reversed writing is probably one reason why so few of his manuscripts have ever been published. His treatise on painting is fortunately available in English translation. It is still instructive to the artists of our time, as is one of the most thorough and comprehensive studies of the art ever written. Throughout, Leonardo emphasizes that the painter must study nature and never imitate the manner of others. Alone among Renaissance artists, there was in him no looking backward to the classic past. The same eager absorption in the study of nature shows in the carefully recorded innumerable observations and reflections in the various fields of science. These are as valuable now for our scientists as the treatise on painting for our artists. The most amazing phase of his activity was his wide range of invention. He announced two centuries before Watt watched his tea kettle lid go up and down that steam could be used to drive ships. He invented a screw propeller, now universally used. He cast new forms of cannon and decorated them beautifully. He invented new musical instruments. He drew plans for a submarine and for an aeroplane. The fall of Lodovico ended Le Leonardo's stay in Milan. For a year, he was in service with Caesar Borgia, carrying through engineering works, making maps, and counseling on warfare. At 52, he returned to Florence, now the most famous man of his time. Michelangelo, 23 years younger, was just winning recognition. The seniory of Florence decided to have the council chamber in their palace decorated and commissioned both Leonardo and Michelangelo to paint frescoes on its walls. The friends and disciples of the two great masters rallied to them and made their work a sort of public competition. Michelangelo chose for his subject the Pisan soldiers surprised by the Florentines while bathing in the Arno. This gave an opportunity for his marvelous handling of naked bodies in action. Benvenuto Cellini, who studied the cartoon during some months of his youth, says it was greater than anything Michelangelo achieved in painting, not accepting the frescoes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Benvenuto, however, was appreciative only of technical skill. 
Michelangelo never executed the painting, and the cartoon itself is wholly lost, the drawing of a fragment of it being the only surviving echo. Leonardo chose for his subject a famous Florentine victory, the Battle of Anghiari. The work he did in preparation was amazing. He studied bodies of men in action, noted down the effect of rising dust on the appearance of bodies at different levels, and similar details of exact research. He believed he had rediscovered the ancient Greek method of fresco painting, and so painted in oils directly on the plaster. Then he built a fire at the bottom to dry the colors. The heat, of course, did not extend evenly upward. The bottom was overburned. Above, the colors did not amalgamate properly with the plaster. Leonardo abandoned the work in disgust. The unfinished painting was afterwards utterly destroyed. Its only echo is an engraving from a copy by Rubens of a bit of it, the Battle of the Standard. So perished what would have been one of the first great military paintings in the history of European art. The whole story is further evidence of Leonardo the experimenter and scientist, even more than artist. After four years of work, Leonardo completed his greatest portrait, that Mona Lisa with a smile of mystery, subject of more questioning discussion than any other painting. Other artists interpret personality. Leonardo in painting, like Shakespeare in the drama, gives personality as nature creates, with all the mystery of it intact. Leonardo indeed expressed the wish that he might write of the psychology of human beings with the same thoroughness which he had studied physical organisms. Meantime, Francis I was beckoning across the Alps, seeking to make Paris the successor of the Italian capitals as a center of art. After brief periods at Milan and the Rome of Leo X, Leonardo accepted the French king's invitation and journeyed to France. He worked the last three years of his life for the French king, dying in 1519 at the age of 67. A brief threnody from his notebooks gives the attitude of his late years. O time, thou that consumest all things, O envious age, thou destroyest and devourest all things with the hard teeth of the years, little by little, in slow death. Helen, when she looked in her mirror and saw the withered wrinkles which old age had made in her face, wept and wondered to herself why ever she had been twice carried away. O time, Thou that consumest all things, O envious age, whereby all things are consumed. Painting is quite inadequate to express Leonardo da Vinci, even if so much of his work had not been lost. His greatness is the astounding range of his activity and achievement, making him the most myriad-minded of men. The best portrait of him is the red chalk drawing of the Turin Museum which is certainly from his own hand. It portrays him aged with beard and long curling but thinning hair. The eyes are still intense, the lips compressed with almost a touch of cynic scorn from looking down and across life so long. Like a Himalayan peak, Leonardo towered above the age, cosmopolitan master mind of the Renaissance of all time. Leonardo da Vinci, the mastermind of the Renaissance, has been the subject of this seventh program in a new series titled Lives of Great Men, presented by Dr. Edward Howard Griggs, distinguished lecturer, critic, and author. Copies of last week's talk on Savonarola and tonight's discussion of Leonardo da Vinci may be obtained by addressing the National Broadcasting Company, Radio City, New York, or the station to which you are listening. <laughs>